This is Robert Kraft and I'm your host on SNN Network and we are a proud media sponsor for the upcoming Precious Metals Summit, uh, which is going virtual, same time though, but going virtual in September, 2020. Joining me right now is Teo Dechev. She is the president and CEO of Mondoro Capital. It's a publicly traded company. The symbol is M-U-N on the TSX Venture. Teo, thank you for joining me today. How are you doing? It's great to be back. I'm doing well. How are you? It's great to have you back. We're doing, you know, look, no complaints, but uh, if you want me to, uh, we could do that at a separate interview. You can interview me. We'll be like a therapy session. Sure. <laughs> so uh, it's been actually about a year. Well, okay, before we get to the update, let's do a very, very mm -hmm. quick overview of what Mondoro does, and then, and then we'll get into an update. Uh, absolutely. Um, so the Best way to think about us is value creation through mineral assets. And essentially what we've done is created strategic land packages around uh, existing known mining districts. And specifically, we're focused in on Serbia and Bulgaria. Um, we've created a, a regional district scale uh, land package in Eastern Serbia and the Boer district. Uh, we've started partnering that off. Uh, we've brought in partners over the years and our um, uh, kind of potential for all these projects is to essentially dilute into a royalty position for each of these mineral projects. So there's eight of them. Um, one of them is joint ventured with Jogmec, another one, uh, another four are joint ventured with Valet, and the remaining three are um, available for optioning with new groups, which we're currently in discussions with. All right, so let's get to that update. It's been actually, I think the last time we talked was I think like this week, last year, yes. uh, a lot's changed, right? I mean, just in the world and, and, and potentially in the company. So let's, let's dig into that. What are, what are some of the corporate highlights, would you say, in the last year? Uh, that's a really great question. You know, the, the first quarter, um, we got a really strong squeeze in the copper market as a result of the health pandemic. Um, that created um, a real downward pressure on the copper prices, primarily because there was, uh, you know, a perception at the time that um, there would be significant slowdown uh, in the economy, and clearly there was, but there has been since then a significant pickup. So what we saw in the first quarter was, um, and one of our partners, Freeport, make a, a knee-jerk reaction uh, to what was going on in the copper market, and so they actually dropped their global uh, um, what we call Greenfield Exploration Portfolio. Our um, two of our projects that were partnered with Report were part of that decision. So two of our projects actually came back to Mondoro um, pretty much at the end of the first quarter. Uh, and as a result, now those projects are back in our hands 100%. And now we've entered into new uh, confidentiality agreements with new third parties about joint venturing out those projects. Uh, because Freeport had invested about 3.2 million US over the course of 18 months, walked away 100%, and now all that valuable data, someone else can immediately pick up on and continue drilling with and doing work on. So it wasn't a reflection of the projects um, or the results. It was really a reflection of what was uh, what a really intense squeeze on the copper markets in that, in that you know, let's call it three months that um, overlapped between, let's say, March and, and uh, right into the end of May. So would you say that, you know, the corporate highlights that you just went through, do they all fit? I mean, obviously, look, notwithstanding what happened with COVID, which is still ongoing, you know, notwithstanding that, would you say all these highlights are things that really fit the vision that you've had for the company up until this point? Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> you know, we're a big believer that the copper market, um, you know, it's fascinating. I've been in the business for 20 years and uh, the precious metals markets, um, certainly gold gets a lot of attention, you know, and there's a lot of gold bugs out there. And, you know, we all believe in the future value of gold, but fundamentally, fundamentally, copper has a real tangible need. And especially if we're all buying into this concept of electrification of our, of our society, you know, electric vehicles, um, getting more uh, electric power online. That world needs copper. As we have more uh, alternatives to gold, which is what it's traditionally used for is, is a currency, uh, there are alternatives today which are getting much more traction in the markets in terms of uh, cryptocurrency. So our fundamental view is that 
you know, the dynamics of why the gold market change, um, trades is going to change. In, in reality, we probably shouldn't be mining any more gold. The gold above the ground will become more and more valuable as, it, as it's a finite commodity that is competing with other alternatives for store of value. But the copper market, we need to mine more and more natural copper resources. So fundamentally, as a driver in our company for the last 10 years, we have um, clearly seen that there is a huge demand for copper assets. So our focus in the Tethian belt, and this is something, you know, A, we went there because there was really good potential for large scale uh, new discoveries, but also it is a extremely well established copper district. It has been mining uh, for a hundred years copper. So we kind of see it as, you know, Serbia as the, as the Chile of Europe. And we think that market is going to become more and more established over the next decade and two. So we've um, built a very strategic land position. Our assets are focused on copper and gold with primarily copper um, miners as our partners. And our vision is that, you know, we're not sitting here telling investors that, you know, someday we're going to become a, um, a miner in, in a, a large scale uh, copper porphyry mine. What we're saying is that we're the catalyst for those land packages, for those discoveries that we then transition into our mining partners, and then we get carried through a royalty that creates substantial value for our shareholders. So let me ask you a question. And, and I asked this the other day because um, I was talking with an economic geologist who, you know, they, they had this project where um, they'd known about it for 25 years, and yet yes. they only recently went in and now doing, you know, you just mentioned uh, for in where you're, you're look, so I don't want to, I don't want to say the name because I'm going to butcher it, but uh, <laughs> the, the Tethion belt, right? Yes, yes. Okay, I said it right. You know, so you said that there's been mining going on here for over 100 years, you know, what, what has taken so long and how were you strategically there to take advantage of some of these potential opportunities? That is such a great question. Um, you know, in the geological world, there's no, you know, people are not surprised uh, when you talk about the metallogenic belt of the Tethian belt. You know, everybody recognizes that there's lots of mineral resources there. It had been primarily in Soviet hands for a very long time. Let's say until, you know, clearly until the uh, early 1990s when um, the communist, let's call it, wall fell in 91. But after that, you know, it went through years of transition where, you know, the governments were just starting to get their footing in terms of how the rule of law worked. I'm going to say that didn't really start to take a foot, uh, kind of a, a firm foothold until probably 2008. So it took a long time to transition. When we got there, it was in 2010. And the the government had been right at that important part of their what I call mineral industry life cycle of transitioning their laws into a more um, Western context, meaning here's exactly how you pick up a license, here is exactly what is required to maintain a license, and here's how you transition into an exploitation license. Without those three catalysts in the law, it's very difficult for foreigners to invest. That happened in Peru and Chile back in the 70s and 80s. That is why you see such a strong investment industry and natural resources in South America and particularly those two countries. So we saw that transition happening in Eastern Europe, in Serbia and in Bulgaria. We got there right at that right time. For us, a big thing was being in there first in terms of land packages, because that's obviously in our business, you know, an extremely important catalyst. Um, we got there, we got the, the strategic land package around the Bohr mines. And then since then, because of the really important discovery of Chukarupeki, you remember when Reservoir made that, you know, fantastic discovery with Freeport, which is one of the most valuable copper and gold uh, mines in the world, that refocused investment interest in the district. So geological interest had always been there, but the investment community needed convincing that it was the right place to invest. And, and that has finally transitioned. It occurred through mineral law changes and then through a mineral discovery to, for people to realize, okay, this, this is actually a, a, an important place to be for mineral investment. And Teo, another question that I have for you, for those who may not know, what, what does good drill results look like for copper? You know, when you're, you know, we've, I've heard gold and, and what high grade means and, so, and that, mm -hmm. but I haven't had gotten that for copper. So what, what exactly does that mean? 
It is such a good question. And uh, I think everybody you ask is going to have a slightly different answer. Um, so the, the, the average right now in the industry are, are kind of the rule of thumb that a lot of companies are using is let's say 0.5 is ideal for open pit, 0.5% copper. But if you go underground, you need, you clearly need a higher grade and, and kind of the rule of thumb is let's say 1%. But if you can do block caving, which is essentially kind of like think of open pit mining, but underground, you have this ore body and you actually take it out in giant chunks as opposed to putting in like drifts across and then selectively mining out. You're taking out chunks of ore. That's what they call block cave mining. If you can do block cave mining, which is not, it's not, a, it's not an easy task. There's only about six companies globally in the world that have done it successfully. If you can do that, you can probably get away with 0 0.7, 0 0.8% copper underground. Uh, so when you look at that, when you look at, um, you know, the results of um, copper deposits that are being drilled, a lot of what we're seeing in the industry is that 0 0.3, 0 0.4, that can be economic under certain conditions. Like for example, is it an established mining district? Are there roads and infrastructure already there that you're not paying for? If that's already been established for you, then 0.3.4% can work in an open pit, but it depends on obviously the size as well. So it's not, the thing with copper is that it's fascinating. It's such an important market in terms of its use but it's mining is, is such a, it's a smaller industry in terms of the number of miners. So it's a more, it's, it's extremely high engineered mines. Uh, a lot more investment goes into them, which is why you don't get a lot of juniors that are explore for copper projects. It kind of tends to stay with the big guys, but the big guys have been, as you know, put under a lot of pressure to reduce costs. So a lot of that exploration uh, expertise has been leaving the big guys, going into small niche groups, and those have become kind of the leaders in copper exploration. And you know, we like to believe that we're one of those because a lot of our team is from those ex Rio Tinto, ex uh, Anglo American teams that have done copper exploration for decades. So. You know, you, and I know that's a bit of a long answer, but when you think about copper, you think about 0.3, 0.4% is doable in, an, in an, a well-established mining camp. The further far afield you go from that, think about 0.5%. And then if you go underground, it's gotta be 1% if you're doing more traditional uh, selective mining. And if you're thinking about block caving, about 0.7% can, can work. So Teo, from what you can tell us, what, what would you say are some of the company's value catalysts now moving forward for the rest of this year and going into 2021? Um, absolutely. So we are 100% focused on the partnership model uh, and bringing more partners into our three remaining Serbian assets. Uh, and then, of course, you know, we've also been building out our strategy uh, towards the east into Bulgaria. Uh, that's a little bit more of a complicated jurisdiction to work in. It takes a lot more time to get mineral uh, resource assets established through contracts with the government. But once those are established, they're uh, very clear in the law in terms of how that transitions into exploitation licenses. Uh, and so our view is for the next uh, six months, important catalyst for the company is uh, getting more partners in Serbia for those projects, working with our existing partner, Valet, which is the world's third largest gold mining company, uh, to explore on the existing projects that we have with them. And then in Bulgaria, uh, at least signing hopefully one contract with the government in order to start establishing another uh, path for more partnerships in Bulgaria for copper and gold assets. And with that, where can my audience go and find everything they need to know about Mondoro Capital? Uh, our website. Uh, you know, we, we spend a lot of time on constantly updating it. You're going to get good information on the projects. These kind of videos, uh, you know, a quick <laughs> link to the YouTube page. Um, and, you know, people can call us. They can set up. Actually, we've set up this new virtual coffee where you can just make a, a click on the website and uh, you'll have a, you know, a 20 minute meeting with me to give you an update on, on how things are going. That's a great idea.
Oh my yeah, we gosh. love it. Every I feel every public company should do that. That's 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 genius. I love that. Uh, what and, and the URL is mandorocapital.com, correct? Uh, mandoro.com. Mandoro.com. Okay. Yes. Just want to make sure. Well, with that, thank you so much, Teo. It's always a pleasure speaking with you. Good luck. Stay safe, and uh, I look forward to our next update. Thanks, Robert, and have a great day. Thank you. My name again is Robert Kraft. I'm your host for SNN Network, and we are a proud media sponsor for the Precious Metal Summit virtual conference now coming up in September 2020. You'll see Teo there. And uh, you'll, well, virtually you'll see her there. But uh, <laughs> thank you again and uh, talk soon.